in our series of talks with uh, people I used to know in the poker world uh, back in those years when I was working full time with poker, I have come to uh, the point where I'm going to talk to Norman Shad. Everyone knows who Norman Shad is, the presenter for World Series of Poker to, uh, together with uh, Lon McGarren. Uh, we had a half an hour of talk, it was really nice and I look forward to uh, present it to you. This episode is, as always, presented uh, together with our partner Every Game Poker. It's uh, September 2022 and I'm talking to Norman Chad. Uh, it's a pleasure to talk to you, Norm. How are you, Norman? Uh, I was fine until a moment ago and now let's see how it goes. So uh, tell me about, uh, where, do, where do you live now? I have... I moved to Los Angeles, California about 30 years ago with the plans to stay here for about two years. Uh, and uh, unfortunately, I'm now here for 30 years. Is that unfortunately? Well, to tell you the truth, I, I like big cities where you spill out into the streets. Uh, Los Angeles is just a series of exit ramps and strip malls and nail salons. So even though I've gotten used to Los Angeles over the years and the weather and the food and, and its advantages, I would prefer to be in a, you know, in a San Francisco, a New York, a Paris, a Barcelona, you know, yeah. something, something like that. Yeah, yeah, I understand that. But there's quite a few things that is good about LA as well. Are you, are you much of a traveling man? Do you like to travel? You know, I, I traveled a lot uh, before I got older, and then traveling just got more difficult. It got more difficult for everybody with, you know, security. Just it just became a layer of stress after stress after stress. So right now, again, I love I love traveling on trains. We have a terrible train system in general in America, but I used to love traveling on trains throughout Europe. So yeah, I, I'd love to travel until it got a little too difficult. Okay, I see. Well, uh, the people that are, have been into poker know you from there, but you had uh, you had quite a, a career before that. You uh, you were much into sports, weren't you, as a sports journalist, uh, Norman? Yeah, actually, throughout almost the entire poker run, I remained a sports columnist, which is what I did before poker. So yeah, I, I was fortunate enough when I was in college to start working part-time at the Washington Post. And then I worked full-time or part-time for the Washington Post until about a year and a half ago. And I've been writing sports columns for about 35 years. So even during the whole poker boom thing, I was writing a once a week sports humor column that poker people would never see. Yeah, would you say it's been, most of it has been with a touch of, of comedy to it always? Has that been your your angle to it? Or has you, have you also, uh, been spending a lot of time being very serious about it. No, I seldom get serious. So when before I did this sports humor column, uh, which I've done, the, which I did like the last twenty years, called Couch Slouch, because I'm just sitting on the couch. Uh, I did a sports television column, which is really stupid. That's just watching the the games on TV and then commenting on them. Uh, this is not really advanced civilization much, but I decided just to make that into a comedy entertainment thing. And so yeah, from the beginning, it's just sort of making jokes about all the games that that pass by my front door. Or pass by on my television. Are you happy with the choice you made to end up doing what you did? Would you say? Yeah, you know, that that's difficult to say. Uh, the short answer would be probably not happy with the choice. Uh, and you know, I, I had a a fork in the road uh, when I moved to Los Angeles. I believe, yeah, when I moved to Los Angeles, I had a fork in the road. I either can move to Paris and become a sports columnist for the International Herald Tribune. Uh, it was their first sports column uh, position, and I'd be traveling a lot in Europe to live cover games, or I could move to Los Angeles and continue to do my humor stuff for Sports Illustrated. So if, because I chose Los Angeles, that's how I ended up in poker, as it turns out. But as far as just sitting on the couch all day and making jokes about sports on TV and then making jokes about what people look like at the poker table, I, I don't know if that's going to be really regarded that well if I get to the pearly gates. You know, over, over to the right there. Uh, we're not sending you to hell, but you're going to be in purgatory for a while with a bunch of poker players. Yeah, yeah, I understand that. I, I, I thought about a thing. You know, you, you're always the guy who, who with, with Lorne McGarren, uh, the guy who always comes up with the funny stuff that people really enjoy to watch, at least most of them. Do you always feel a pressure or is it natural for you to always do it with that angle of with humor in it, even in the poker world? Is that like something you have to do and feel like you are doing all the time? No, it comes quite. It comes pretty natural, Richard. So even before, you know, I never knew I was going to be doing poker on television. Of course. But before that, just my attitude in general. It's it's when I'm talking about myself, I'm going to be self-deprecating and self-effacing, 
And when I'm talking about other people, especially people I know well, I'm going to make fun of them. And I'd love, you know, I'd love sitting in a, a sidewalk cafe with somebody else. And we just, people walk by and just make comments about them that if they were heard at that point, they'd throw you, you know, they'd throw you out of the cafe. Yeah. But so I just like commenting again on, you know, on the carousel that's going by me. And it comes naturally to me just to really take it with a lighter sensibility. Yeah, I understand. Yeah, that's great. It's like uh, um, watching people. It's interesting to see people and how they act. And, and, and I mean, you, you've been, a, what do you call that? Um, uh, a judge, a judge of character of people. And, and uh, that's interesting, right? It is. It's, it's incorrect, by the way, a lot of the times. Like we, I have often, as often as anybody else, I will judge a situation, a person, uh, before I even really know it. You know, like a prejudge thing based on what it looks like, what they look like, what their background is. And I found out over the years, I'm really wrong as often as I'm right. But it is fun to sit back and, you know, just if a couple is sitting nearby, you, you, you just discuss the couples getting along with each other, what their background is, how they met each other, how their future is going to be. It's just it's a great way to pass the day while you're drinking uh, some Cabernet. Yeah, I understand that. OK, so so just for those, I mean, uh, what was the first year you got in? What was it? 2003? Just the, the, the was it the moneymaker year you got into poker? Yeah, coincidentally, uh, it was uh, 03. And it was the moneymaker winning the World Series of Poker. And uh, actually on ESPN that year, they did seven telecasts, seven one-hour telecasts of the final table. And I did it with Lon. Lon had done it the year before when they did like a one- or two-hour telecast. Uh, he had come in and voiced the year before with Gabe Kaplan. And then 03 was the first year ESPN decided, let's expand this and see if we can you know, just get some more mileage out of the World Series of Poker. Yeah. And of course, it was, a, it was that little thing that there was a... Um, uh, Chris Moneymaker was the guy that opened up the floodgates in a way for, for the general public. Uh, that, that's common knowledge, isn't it? Yeah, you know, it's, it kind of oversimplifies uh, the, the boom that happened, but it was made larger without question with Chris Moneymaker and his story and his name. But I've always said if, if Sam Farhall won that year, uh, there still would have been a poker boom. It just wouldn't have been as big. And the poker boom that Chris Moneymaker and the World Series was, was part of was part of a confluence of a lot of things. The World Poker Tour, the whole pole, pole card camera for the first time on U.S. television. The World Poker Tour started the same year and had an audience. So that with Moneymaker, the World Series of Poker, and then the hidden engine for all this was online poker. Uh, so people were playing online for the first time in large numbers. And then the online sites were providing the advertising base for all this poker on television. Yeah, it was a good combination of factors, of course. I, I remember seeing uh, John Duffy winning the first TV tournament on Isle of Man, I think it was. Uh, just an average Joe that won this tournament, bluffing everyone because he wanted to make the, the game more fun for the audience, which worked out pretty well. Have you seen that, uh, Norman? No, you know, I haven't seen that. But that's a, that's a great example of why it, it had that attraction for people, whether they played poker or they didn't. And if they just play poker casually, they'd see, oh, look, I can do what he's doing. You know, I can go be out there and be bluffing these big guys or I can win. You know, Chris Moneymaker was an accountant. So I think that's one of the big attractions to people wanting to watch it early on. Yeah. How about your own poker game? I know you had a few good, uh, some final tables and so on. Have you, have you always been fond of the, uh, the mixed games? Yeah, I never played and I still don't. I never played Hold'em or No Limit Hold'em in particular to this day. Uh, and this is almost 20 years into doing it. I have never played. I've played maybe No Limit Hold'em Cash once or twice in my life, and I've never played a No Limit Hold'em tournament unless it was a charity event. So essentially, I don't play what we televise, and I don't know much about what we televise, which is why I concentrate on what people are wearing and stuff like that because I really don't know the game that well. Well, I, I understand that. What, what, what mixed games? Is it just the mix when you play many different, or is it specific mixed game? Oh, uh, stud game or, or any other game that you prefer? I prefer just about anything else, but before before the online, uh, this comes in two parts. I, I always played, you know, I'll play stud, stud eight, PLO, Omaha eight, triple draw, but they're hard to find in casinos. So the game I played over the years generally was a stud eight, Omaha eight mix. Oh. The two I, I didn't play online poker ever until the pandemic and the quarantine. And I was talked into playing into a game which I would not have joined except it was Zoomed. It was people I knew. And so it was almost you could see everybody and talk to everybody. It would feel like a home game. If I was just sitting there pushing buttons, I would have said no. 
and this was a 22 game mix. Wow. So about half the games I never played before. And now after playing it for two years, when I go back and sit and play in a two game mix, like even playing a horse, which is five games, I'm actually a little bored. I want to play more games. I want to play all these variants. So yeah, I love playing all the different games, even if I'm not very good at them. Yeah, I see. Yeah, I know. I know. There's plenty of um, Bidasi, Badusi, even Dromaha. What What are the weirdest game? Which is the weirdest game in that 22 mix? You know, we threw out the weirdest game in the 22 game mix uh, because it wasn't offered in casinos, and we never heard of it before. They offered it at the site. It was called Blendum. And people, I like to play it, but people didn't like it. So essentially it was Omaha 8 at the end. But you're dealt two cards. There's going to be a board. You're dealt two cards and you bet. And then when the flop comes out, you are giving a third card for yourself. And then when the turn comes out, you're given a fourth card for yourself. And that's, you know, then you're going to play Omaha 8 using two cards out of your hand with what the board is out the river. People really were bothered by that. Uh, I guess since I didn't have much skill, I liked it. Mm. So that was probably the weirdest game we played that got thrown out. All the others were all the you know all the Badugi, yeah, yeah, yeah. All the, the Dramaha variants. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, it sounds interesting that game. I should try it sometime. Now, now over the years, I mean, I I, I started working with poker in two thousand five, and there was always in the beginning there was always these big characters, which has kind of got down a little bit. Uh, wh who were the your favorite characters back in the early years? Yeah, and so in the early years, it was character-driven. Uh, in fact, we, didn't, we did nothing on strategy virtually, and that's because I don't know anything about strategy. But so, you, you know, to, to have people that were very animated at the table made it better for the telecast. So that means Phil Hellmuth. That means Mike the Mouth Mattiso. Uh, that means a, a young Daniel Grano who, who talked a lot at the table. So those guys just make it, it just makes it a lot easier to carry a telecast and a lot more enjoyable. You know, I've always said one of the, one of the, the great joys of that is that you know, when we watch professional football in the U.S., afterwards, the NFL films would always do these long videos in the postseason where you saw the coaches on the sidelines yelling and they were miking everybody up. But that came after the fact. Our thing is that you can mic them up during the game or during a poker tournament, and you hear what they're saying as it's happening. It's, you don't have to a year later when they're doing these films together. So I think that really made it easier for people to watch when they could hear the participants talking back and forth to each other. Yeah, yeah, of course. Yeah, yeah, there were plenty of those. Do you think there is, uh, is hope for it? I mean, it's changed a bit, the poker world since then. Is it possible to get that back? I know it's, it's of course, characters today as well, but not like it was back then, right? Yeah, it's. It, I, I think... It's going to be hard to put the genie back into the bottle uh, as far as they go to the live streams and it's become much more poker centric. But I do believe that this was a, a tragic uh, turn of events for the, the mainstream casual poker audience that it's that the game is hurt. We, we restrict our audience when we make it very strategic and very poker centric. And we don't concentrate on the characters and who they are and their personality and their background. So, yeah, we can go back the other way. I fear that. I don't know when we're going to, but I do believe we've made a mistake. Uh, live poker for most people, especially a live poker tournament that lasts many, many, many hours, there's not a lot of attraction there. So the, the cut down version where you just see the best hands and where you get features on the players and then you root for them or you root against them. I just think it's a lot better way to go. Uh, obviously, that's not the way you do with live sports, but I think poker is a different animal, and I think we made a mistake in going in the direction we did. Yeah, I remember when I started doing what I did, I, I thought it was interesting. Like they had in the UFC, for example, when they had the Ultimate Fighter show. To make it big, you needed to, to support or hate someone. Uh, and, and they did a good job with that in poker in the beginning as well. Uh, so, so you mean... Is it possible to do that today, to kind of lift them up and, and go closer to them? Or are the most of the poker players too private? See, it's, it's, it's the, the answer is somewhere in the middle. It is possible to do it. And again, the younger group tends to be you know, more GTO, mathematical. We don't want to deal with the outside stuff. But there's a story behind everybody. And sometimes they're really interesting. And if you explain the, how the, 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 the game can grow by doing it this other way, and you then start to talk to these, you know, the Stephen Chidwick or Jason Bonomo, you know, or, or Fedor, and you establish their, who they are and what they are. 
you can go back that way. And I know it's harder to do, you know, when you're 20 something, you don't have that much of a, as much of a history as like a Miami John Cernudo who started playing poker at 42 because he lost his job as an air traffic controller when president Reagan fired them all because they went on strike. So, I mean, those, you know, so he has a lot of history before he got into poker as would like Howard Letterer or Chip Reed or Doyle. So it's harder to find the stories when you're 23 years old, but they're still there. And I think we can go that other way and just be a little more, you know, Devilfish Elliott was ahead of his time in understanding that it's not about the cards. It's not about the game. It's about everything else around it. So Devilfish was great for television. Daniel Grano understood that before he was 30. That's not about the cards. It's about everything else. We can do that again. Mm. Yeah, yeah, I hope so too. So so, so, so you plan to, to stay uh, in poker and do it again, continue to do it, because the numbers in the World Series this year were, were incredibly good, weren't they? Yeah, but why, again, if, if, again, if we have not lost online poker in the United States, uh, whatever, 10 years ago, the numbers would be off the charts right now. But they're back healthy again, and I still think we need to make the, the television part in on all parts of the Beyond the World Series, uh, World Poker Tour, other things, live cash games. We need to make that part more attractive to, to gain back the audience. You mentioned the UFC. The, you know, the UFC did not even exist 20, 25 years ago. What they do is what you just said is terrific. They did what was poker was doing at the beginning. They they just come out there and they, they do a great a great profile of somebody for five or seven minutes and then you're attached to them one way or the course, other. Yeah. They, the other person, then you know, you have you're rooting for somebody or you're rooting against somebody. They've been brilliant in the way they do that. I think we've lost our way in poker and not doing that the way that we should. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I agree. I agree. And hopefully, it's possible to do that. Do Do you think there's any hope for uh, online poker to come back in the states? I I don't know. I'm not updated to where we are right now, but we're in a bad place. Uh, it, you know, it's coming back state by state, which is piecemeal, is very hard, very long. And so, a place like California, where I live, which is the you know biggest population base, I don't know when it's going to come back. It's just it's just tied up in a lot of political stuff. So to come back piecemeal where it's just a few states and it's 10 states, it's very difficult. And then online poker is taking some blows to the head. Uh, you know, safety of your money, integrity of the game, this and that. And so we got to recover from that as well. Eventually, it's going to be big, but the United States is just behind the curve right now because of what happened uh, 10 years ago. Yeah, I see, I see. Yeah, yeah, it's, it's a shame. I, I remember they said poker is the American people's favorite pastime pastime was for me as a Swede was difficult for me to understand what that meant but it's like the thing you like to do when you're not working or hanging out with the family what is it it used to be anyway yeah it, it, it is I mean it's it's the old you know the old expression here is the kitchen the kitchen table game mm. that when you're growing up that you've got you know your parents your uncle your grandfather they'll play for you know they'll play for nickels and dimes or pennies around the kitchen table uh, people in college, again, before online, would play it. People in the military on downtime would play it. People, in, you know, firefighters in the firehouse, you know, cops waiting to do this, they would play it. So, yeah, it, it, it goes way back. There's definitely a tradition in America that, that, that you know, predates uh, this, you know, this century and last century. It goes way back. So, yeah, it is, it is one of America's favorite pastimes. Uh, and it's just something that, you know, you could share with friends or share with family. And so that's a great foundation it's always had. Hmm. Yeah, yeah, I know. That's that's poker anyway. It, it's good it's good that it's around. I hope you one day can get it sorted out and, and with the, the rules that makes uh, the politicians and people that are worried about the economic bits because, of course, there are problems with people who can't handle uh, the money around poker like in, in many other areas. So hopefully you get it sorted out uh, in a few years or something. Who, should, who what, what, what team should run the country for uh, poker to have the best chance to come back as an online sport? Which, which team, who should run the country? To... Yeah, yeah. You know, is it equal? Is it Republicans or Democrats? Is it equally hard on both it, sides? It's equally hard. Uh, we're, we're all, it's, I mean, I can't possibly break this down for you. I can't possibly break it down for myself in under 30 minutes in describing what we're talking about here. But it's it's very difficult. So you have you have what we call Bible Belt states, which are which are obviously more religious and more conservative that would never want gambling, period. Uh, 
and yet the Republicans are all about generally uh, freedom of choice. Keep government out. Whatever you want to do, you can do. So there's a conflict there just within that mm. that, that subset. So yeah, generally uh, a more progressive person, and that would be the Democrats, would say, all right, just we should, you know, should we legalize it, regulate it, and tax it? Uh, but it just isn't that simple to break it down, Democrat or Republican. And it's weird because over the course of years, U.S. presidents have a tradition of being big poker players. Right, uh, right. Years from from George Washington to Abraham Lincoln to to Terry Truman to Richard Nixon to Barack Obama, they all play poker. So when Obama was in office, people were saying, geez, can't we get through to Obama to get this online thing going again? It just isn't that simple. I understand. I, just a question out of, I just, do, you, do you believe in God? You know, I wish I did. I don't know. I am a, ag, what, an agnostic at best. Uh, I hope. The, the, the thing is, it's, it's one of those things where it's like when you, if you go all in, if you've got to make a call and you go all in, it's a, it's a, it's a dicey proposition. If you go all in, you're gone if you're wrong. If you fold because you think he's wrong, because you think he's bluffing, you're not gone. You know, if you fold, you're still in the game. You might be wrong in the game. So I'm hoping, you know, it makes more sense to believe in God. And then in the afterlife, if he's not around, uh, you know, then, you know, you're screwed like the rest of us. Yeah, but yeah. if you believe in God, and then we get to the afterlife and they go, oh, really? That's not possible. Then you're, you're mm. I don't know. Hot, hot down in hell. So I hope that God, but I have not lived my life with any regard that there is one. Because there are so many Americans overall. Uh, I'm from a more secular country than than uh, USA. But <clears throat> do you bump into? Is it something that you hide, or is it something that you put out blunt, bluntly, or is it a sensitive topic? Because quite a few people believe in God even in the poker world. Yeah, I, it's nothing. I it doesn't come up. Like you know, we generally don't talk politics during a broadcast. We certainly don't talk uh, religion or anything related to God. It, if it comes up naturally, I would. It comes up at the poker table when I'm playing. Everything comes up at the poker table. I will bring it up. But again, my my thought it always is to each his own. I mean, that's why we you know we've had laws here you know banning same sex relationships or marriages forever, which is just you know tragic to me just let you know let everybody do whatever they want to do as long as they're not in your face or taking a baseball bat to your head let people be so i don't talk about it a lot but if i you know i deal with the most you know most orthodox jewish people in the world i feel i deal with born again christians and i deal with people who don't think god exists it's all fine by me yeah yeah, yeah. i agree with you okay that's good now it, it was really nice to talk to you and and um i mean norm uh, Norman, say something about Lon Mc Aaron. This is how you pronounce it, right? Is yeah, Lon Mc Aaron. Yeah, have you become good friends? Uh, acquaintances. We get along great. We, you know, it's it's we we we're very fortunate. When you're working with somebody that long, or even for not that long, if you don't get along with each other, it's hard. And I've seen it before when uh, two broadcasters co-anchoring the news or two GJs who work a morning show, if, if they don't go, or it's two people on a daytime talk show, yeah. if they don't get along, it makes it very difficult to come into work every day. And it actually reflects on their work eventually. So Lon and I get along great. And I give him most of the credit on that because I'm much more difficult to get along with than he is. Yeah. So it's been a good relationship. We've had hundreds of meals together. Uh, and as far as the work goes, I've said it many times, but you know, if you, if you sober Lon up three, four hours before the broadcast, he does a damn, a damn decent job. So it's just, it's my job to make sure that, uh, he's not drinking too far in front of the broadcast. And then we go out there and we do a, a, a damn decent job. That sounds good. I mean, it's, a, it's a, maybe it's something that since you work together, so, um, uh, in such specific periods, maybe it's a good thing not to be too close friends, you know, because if, if your friendship would hurt, then your work would hurt too. Oh, that's, that's, you know, that's, that's a decent point. We, we do live in different metropolitan areas, so it's hard for us to see each other when we're outside of poker season. And uh, that, that, again, that might lengthen, you know, absence makes the heart grow fonder. And like with my current wife, we're sometimes bi-coastal, and I think the marriage lasts longer because she's not in my company 24 seven. She's just in my company 12 seven. Otherwise I would have been gone years ago. But I think you make a decent point about that uh, as, far as, as fresh and, and keeping us professionally better. There's always been talks about your wife and so on. And now I, I think, have you been together for 15 years? You and your 
wife yeah, now. We just had our 15th anniversary uh, this summer. You happy? Uh, well, so the old saying goes, let me speak for her. She would say, you know, you know, four or five of the best years of my life. However, we've been married for 15. Yes, I'm, I'm happier with her than without her. And I love Tony, and I'm glad that she has decided to stay with me through 15 years. Yeah, excellent. You never thought about, have you Have you explained to her, or you don't have to, I guess, but uh, doubted your uh, ex-wife uh, humor bits in poker because you have a good relationship with Tony? Yeah, she, uh, she, she again, she doesn't even watch, the. you know, she doesn't play poker. She only watches it when someone points out, you got to see what Norman said here. He made funny stories. That's like really stupid. So she never sees the telecast. She has no problem with the ex-wife stuff that I do, which I hardly even do anymore, uh, to tell you the truth. Yeah, yeah, but yeah. It's always been a natural part of my shtick, mm. and she would have no problem with it. Uh, she has more of a problem when I talk about her in a joking fashion, uh, but she has no problem with the ex-wife stuff. Sounds good. Sounds good. Do, do you enjoy doing your, your own podcasts and uh, podcasts? And so on. Is that something you want to continue to do and, and uh, for many years to come? Yeah, I, I actually was thinking of transitioning. You know, I do a, a such it's called Gambling Mad. So it's on hi hiatus right now. It's going to start up again uh, in the next month. And I like, again, it's, it's, it's like I do poker. It's, it's just, it's a light approach to gambling, to sports betting. And I talk about everything else. I'll talk about, you know, I'll talk about politics. I'll talk about the culture. I'll talk about TV. I'll talk about going to restaurants. So it's, it just, it allows you to just sort of lay around and just, kind of spread your wings a little more, uh, which you can't do in a, in a tight broadcast, telecast situation for any particular sport. So yeah, I love doing the gambling podcast and I love talking to people who are smart, uh, whether it's about gambling or sports or food or, or television. So yeah, it's a lot of, it's a lot of fun. Sounds good, uh, Norman. It was really a pleasure to talk to you and thank you for, for, for uh, spending half an hour with the Swede. Uh, hopefully I get back to... Uh, to Vegas and the World Series, and we meet in real life uh, in the future. Yeah, Vegas isn't real life, but yes, it, it's better <laughs> than person. Than... If you would say IRL, when you come to Vegas, what would you call it? In FL? IFL? Oh, I, in, uh, whatever, I think you're close. I... <laughs> in uh, fantasy uh, la life, maybe, or something. Okay, sounds yeah, good. Yeah. yeah, sounds good. Take care of yourself, Norman, and uh, and we'll talk again sometime. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks for listening to the chat with uh, Norman Shad. Really a pleasure to talk to him. Uh, extremely popular guy among you guys that have been watching World Series of Poker over the years. I hope to uh, see him in real life uh, in the future. So um, thanks for watching and this was of course presented together with our uh, partners Every Game Poker. See you next time.